Good morning, church family. We are so glad that you are here with us, whether you are in person or online. My name is Garrett McCord, and I'm the associate minister to students and their families. And I hope everybody is well rested today. We got an extra hour of sleep. Praise the Lord. Can I get a hand clap? Like, I don't know about y'all, but the end of daylight savings time should be a national holiday. It would immediately be top five for me. Like, I will take an extra hour of sleep over like Hobby Lobby candy any day. Um, That is just me, though. But I will tell you what, what has me most pumped up lately uh, actually isn't the holidays. Um, For those of you who know me, I am from Dallas. And so I was born and raised a Dallas Cowboys fan. Watch, I just lost like half the room. They're like, oh, he's a Cowboys fan. Holy Spirit is not going to speak through him. I'm done. I'm walking out. I'm leaving. But I was born and raised in Dallas, proud Cowboys fan. And what do you know? We're actually good. And if you know much about the Cowboys, you know you have to cherish that while it lasts because it's once every like four years. It's like a leap year, basically. And so (laughs) um, I do have to say, though, cheering for them hasn't been easy. And I'm going to get some groans about my age here. But I grew up with the DVDs of the 90s teams. Um, So I grew up getting to watch the, the, the replays of the Super Bowls and, you know, the triplets and Eggman and just this awesomeness. I like I loved the Cowboys. I was so passionate about them. I loved to watch them. Then the 2000s roll along. And uh, what we call the dark ages kind of got ushered in. And uh, what do you know? It just wasn't that much fun to watch them anymore, right? Like you turn on the game and, you know, I I knew I was supposed to watch and be a good fan, but it's really like my heart wasn't there because we were just so bad. It was just so painful to watch, right? Like you knew there was going to be some sort of disappointment. And what had started is this like genuine love had turned into just checking off the box, right? And I know that's a silly story and a silly example, but the reason I tell that this morning is because we're gonna be talking about this idea of losing our first love in a much more serious setting this morning. And speaking of serious settings, I do want to mention that we get to partake in the Lord's Supper today. And as always, I wanna make sure that that's not just an afterthought. We wanna take that in a worthy manner. And so just as we move to where we're gonna be getting to today, just keep dwelling in your mind, thinking about that. Um, If you don't have one, we'll have a time for people to come give you one. Um, But just as we move along, dwell on this question that we're gonna be drilling into this morning. Are you in love with Jesus? There's a sneak peek, but if you've been with us for the last couple of months or if you've been in and out, you know that we've been on this incredible journey throughout the book of Ephesians, right? We have looked at every spiritual blessing we have in Christ, that we are adopted, we are chosen, we are redeemed, and the richness of that. We've looked at the fact that the local church matters, right, and that we have gotten to see how God has specially designed it and given it a place and a role in the life of every single believer. We've gotten to look at Paul's guidance for us in our lives as husbands and wives, parents and children, employer and employee, and just the richness that we can take into every single day life and just be the light for the gospel. And then finally, we finished by walking through the armor of God and how we're to put it on in prayer so that we can fight the battle that rages on spiritually. And it's not our armor, it's not our strength, but it's God's strength and the richness of that the last few weeks. And so if you're like me, you really don't wanna be done with the book of Ephesians, right? It's been so good, it's been so rich, so much application, and thankfully, we're not quite finished with the church at Ephesus just yet. And so this morning, we're gonna be in Revelation chapter two. Don't get your hopes up, it's not that part of Revelation. We're not getting into those weeds today. I'm not qualified for that, not today. But we are in Revelation chapter two, and so as you go ahead and flip there, we're gonna be at the very beginning of chapter two, Um, and if you don't have a Bible with you this morning, there should be a Bible in front of you in the pew rack, Um, and again, if you don't have a Bible, please take that, that is yours, that is a gift from us. You can write in it, you can highlight in it, underline it, circle it, like we want you to have that copy of God's word. And so flipping to Revelation chapter two, we're gonna be looking at the letter to the church in Ephesus. Not the the, the literal book of Ephesians, but the one that John is writing. He's just writing the words of Jesus to the church at Ephesus. And it's about 35 years after the original book of Ephesians. And what I mean by John is writing what Jesus says is that this is a portion of the text in Revelation where Jesus is speaking directly to churches in the region. And John is recording it and delivering it to them. And so, if you would, let's go ahead and read together, starting in chapter two, verse one. Verse one says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, 
and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for this opportunity to get to hear you speak and hear you move. I pray that you would help me to decrease, Lord, that you would increase, that I could just hide behind your word this morning, and that through the preaching of your word, your Holy Spirit would go out and make us look a little bit more like Jesus today, that you would open our hearts, open our minds, open our ears for what you have to say this morning. God, we love you and praise you. Praise things in Jesus' name, amen. So wow, talk about an emotional roller coaster, right? It's like compliment, compliment, you're doing good, and then whammo, you've lost your first love. And if you're like me, you're asking this question, is, is this the same Ephesians we've been reading about for the past year? Right, because the book of Ephesians is so, it's, it's just so positive. It's so encouraging. Literally in chapter one, verse 15, Paul talks about how well they love others. He commends them for their love. And it catches you off guard when you really know the background of the church at Ephesus. And we've talked about it a little bit before we started this huge walk through Ephesians. But Ephesus was this huge trade hub, right? The, it was like the center of this region. There were three major highways that converged all in the same place. And so because of this, it was very metropolitan. It was very well known. It was a center for commerce. Um, and it was just this huge melting pot. It was very um, metropolitan. And so the downside to that is it was also full of wickedness, sin, sexual sin, evil. There was literally a temple built to a fertility god named Artemis, and it was rampant with prostitution and all sorts of wickedness. In fact, this region was so wicked that a philosopher named Heraclitus, who, to the best of my study, wasn't even a Christian, declared the citizens of Ephesus only fit to be drowned due to the complete and utter moral decay. And so this depravity makes the arrival of Ephesus on the scene in scripture like even more shocking, right? Because in Acts 19, Paul travels to Ephesus and he begins to preach the gospel boldly. And it says that this Holy Spirit fell and the number of believers completely exploded, right? It's just this, this huge outpour of just people wanting to give their lives to Jesus and surrendering to the truth of the gospel. And then in what is one of my personal favorite passages in the Bible, some Jewish uh, exorcists called the sons of Sceva uh, decide that they want to catch on to this whole Jesus wave, right? And so they go out and they try to exorcise some demons, but not like genuinely. They just kind of wanted to catch whatever was going on. And so they go up to this demon and they try to exorcise it. And the demon responds, hold on, hold on. Jesus, I know. Paul, I, I recognize that guy. But who are you? And like, if I were these guys, that would be the moment where I'd be like, all right, guys, we're in the wrong place. Like, we shouldn't have come here. This, we goofed. Like, this is not a good idea. We need to leave, like, right now. Um, and, and it's probably true, because what happens next is that the demon overpowers them, and it says that they ran away naked. And look, I don't know about you. I'm not, you know, I dabble in, like, UFC boxing. You know, I'm not a big fighter or anything like that. But if you enter a fight wearing clothes and you leave that fight not wearing clothes, you lost, right? There's no like, oh man, I think you might have pulled it out in round five. You had a really good takedown in there. No, it's over, right? And the worst part is in verse 17, it says, and this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. You gotta move after that, man. Like everybody knows you as the dude who got beaten naked by a demon. Like the whole region, right? And so this is a funny story, but what really happens is in the next verse it says, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. And so this event actually starts a revival in Ephesus. So much so that it says that people started bringing out their books that they had used to practice witchcraft. They brought out their idols. They brought all the stuff that they had used to just dive into sin, and they brought it out in the streets, and they began to burn it in front of everyone, right? And so much so that the text actually says the value of what was burned amounted to about 50,000 pieces of silver. Can you believe that? This is basically the sin city of the ancient world, right? Take Vegas, multiply it by 100. And here these people are so moved by the spirit of God that they run out to the streets and say, here, burn it. I wanna get rid of it. I need Jesus. How Incredible, this 
is the beginning of the church at Ephesus, right? This revival grows so large that it actually disrupts the economy in the town because so many people, so many silversmiths made money off of selling idols to that fertility god Artemis, right? And so they get mad because there's no one to sell idols to anymore because they're all getting saved and they run Paul out of town. That is the beginning of the church at Ephesus, the church that lost their first love. And, and just in case you think, oh, well, they may have started out really hot, and then when Paul got ran out of town, they must have like faded or fizzled. No, the church at Ephesus would go on to have some of the richest leadership in all of the early church, right? The list of leaders who were pastor here or who were elder in some way, shape, or form were Paul, Timothy, Apollos, even John the disciple, the one who's writing this letter in Revelation, Right, John, the one who was part of Jesus' inner circle. John, the one whom Jesus loved. Like, this is the church that you wanted to be at, right? They had all the right leaders, right? In fact, after John was exiled for, for being bold about his faith, so he suffered for his faith, his, his kind of disciple mentee guy, Polycarp, was then martyred for his faith. And Polycarp was the pastor at the time of this church in Ephesus. This is the church you wanted to be at. They rejected false teachers. They stood for true doctrine, right? They fought against, we see later in this letter, there's a reference to the Nicolaitans, and we don't have time to go through all of that this morning, but they're basically this Gnostic group of heretics, which basically means they're just dragging people away from the faith. Like this church fought against them. They found them out. They pointed them out. They did everything right. They were commended for their patient endurance. That means they suffered for their faith. Yet here John is, writing to his former church, Jesus says, you lost your first love. Do you realize the sting that John must have felt writing those words, hearing that from Jesus, hearing that from the one whom he was exiled for? And I mean, guys, if we think about it, that's kind of scary, right? What a warning that is to a church like us today. Right, that this church at Ephesus could do everything right, have the richest leadership, have the richest history, yet still get it wrong, still lose their first love. How in danger are we of falling into the same trap? And so this morning, we have to ask ourselves the question. This is, this is the question that the text wants us to ask. Have we lost our first love? Have we lost our first love? And so in order to do that, we, we really need to first look at what does it even mean to lose your first love? I know that's kind of a vague statement that you may have heard before, but not really gotten a full grip on the meaning. And there's a lot of debate. Um, there's plenty of interpretations. But I think at the end of the day, we have to ask, what is our first love as a Christian? What's the first thing you fall in love with when you're a Christian, when you enter into your church? And the answer is Jesus, right? I mean, think about the revival that happened in Ephesus, it happened after that son of Sceva thing showed how powerful the name of Jesus was. They were moved by Jesus. But somewhere along the way, something changed, right? Some switch flipped. And it wasn't what they did because it said that they did all the right things, but they started doing the right things for the wrong reasons, right? There's this truth that motives matter, that God wants the heart not just the head and the hands. Our actions don't matter if the motive behind them isn't what it should be. And the motive behind them should be a sincere love for Jesus. And right, I don't even have to come up with a clever illustration for this. I promise, I'm not just pulling it out of thin air. This idea is ripped straight from scripture. This is exactly what Paul lays out in 1 Corinthians 13, verses one through three. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, men and of angels, these magnificent tongues, but do not have love, I have a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith is to remove mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give away all I have, anybody here want to sell everything they have? If I deliver my body up to be burned, but do not have love, I gain nothing. And do we understand the craziness, the depth of what Paul just said? That we can do everything right, we can prophesy, 
right? We can speak, we can understand it. We can have all knowledge, understand all the theological talking points, all the arguments, all the stances, right? Have a faith that can remove mountains, which is a genuine faith, right? Because only faith that's genuine can do stuff like that. We can literally sell everything and be burned at the stake for our faith, be martyred, but if there's no love, it's all a waste. It's all pointless. See, the Bible demands that we have affection for Jesus, that we have a real love for Jesus Christ. And we can't just coldly do what we're told to do, do what we know we're supposed to do, do what we learned to do in Sunday school, do what we learned to do growing up in the church. We can't just check off those boxes coldly without any emotion, without any feeling, and think that everything is all right. Our actions must be motivated by a love for Jesus. And so we've seen what it means to, to, to lose your first love, but the question still remains is how did they actually get there, right? Like it's one thing understanding, okay, this is what it means, cool, avoid that. But what was the process that took a church like Ephesus that far? And the scary thing is, the sad thing is, it's a process we're all fairly familiar with. Because if losing our first love means that our actions are no longer motivated by love and affection for Jesus, that happens when we become more motivated by gaining approval from man than doing what pleases God. I'll say that again. How that happens is we become more motivated by gaining approval or praise from man than doing what pleases God. And the thing is, this usually happens in a church setting. I have a story to kind of illustrate this. Um, there was this, this, this man named Martin Lloyd-Jones who was a famous theologian back in the early to mid 20th century. Um, he was an excellent preacher, um, teacher. He was a great student of the word of God. And he had this thing he did when he would read from a hymnal um, he would just look down at the hymnal and focus on the text. He didn't want to look up. He didn't want to do anything that would seem demonstrative or distracting. It was just this personal conviction as he just wanted to look at the text, right? And now he never pushed this on anybody else. He never told anybody, hey, this is how you're supposed to do it. This is just what he felt the Lord told him. But of course, him being a well-known pastor and preacher, once he started doing this, what do you think all the young preacher boys in his congregation started to do? The very same thing, right? They started to look down and focus at the text. And not only did they start to do that, but they started to let it turn into this kind of cultural thing where if you weren't the one who was looking down at your hymnal, oh, look at that guy, he's trying to be distracting, right? He's, he, what is he doing? He's not focusing, he's, you know, he's, he's off, he's just trying to... Something that had started as a personal conviction from the Lord morphed into something that was done in order to appear righteous. And this is one silly example, but this happens all the time in our church, right? Like we start out in our faith with, with, we wanna just do what pleases the Lord. We want to go and we wanna chase after Jesus. And we don't really know what that looks like, but we know that we just wanna do it, right? We wanna look holy, we wanna look good. And we start looking around at people and we start seeing what they're doing. And so we start trying to do that because, well, they seem like they have it all together. So I think I just need to fit in and, and I'll just, you know, I just, I don't wanna look, I don't, I wanna be up with them, right? And then all of a sudden we look up and we're just doing all these things to fit in, not because we feel like God's told us or not because we're trying to please God, but just because we think that's what we're supposed to do to look good, right? And we have this long list of made up rules that we break our backs trying to do just to impress someone, right? It's like, oh, well, you better go to this. You better go to that. You have to be a part of 15 Bible studies minimum, right? Better not drink. You better raise your hand in worship. And it's even better if you can like force a little tear out somewhere in the middle. People will really think you're holy, right? And if you didn't post about your quiet time, did it even happen? It's all for appearances. It's all for appearances. None of that stuff's bad in and of itself, but when it's done to gain the praise of man, it is worthless in the eyes of the Lord, and guys, this is exactly what the Pharisees got blasted for time and time again, right? Think back to the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, don't pray to be heard. Don't give to the poor to be seen. When you fast, don't distort your face so that people will think you're super holy. He says, if you do, you've already received your reward in full because you're just trying to gain the praise of man. We cannot seek the praise of man and the heart of God at the same time. We cannot seek praise and God. And again, this isn't something I'm just making out of thin air. Galatians 1.10, Paul says, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? 
Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. That's sharp. When we lose our first love is when we go from wanting to please God to wanting to gain praise from man. That is how it happens. That's how a church like Ephesus falls so far. And it's a slow burn, it's a slow shift. It's one that usually starts with good intentions. But where it leads us is, is just worthlessness, right? So thankfully, this letter doesn't end here, right? In fact, Jesus provides us the hope in the next verse, which is a great place in the sermon for a little bit of hope, right? Like, man, they let this youth guy up here and he just makes us all feel terrible. Like, get rid of that guy, right? But there's hope in this, right? We've talked about what it looks like to lose your first love, how that happens, and now we're gonna talk about how we fix it, right? And so we're gonna start in verse five. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works that you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And so the Ephesians church is given very simple command, right? Remember, repent. Makes it sound so simple, right? Look back at the love you had at first, figure out how to get back there. Right? We need to drop our legalism, drop the impure motives, and just pick up Christ. And I know that sounds very simple, but you're probably sitting there and you're like, okay, great. I'm just gonna go figure out how to do that, right? There's, it's not the most cut and dry thing in the world. I get that. And so with the rest of the time that we have here today, I would like to just give some easy handles on how we can go about either preventing losing our first love or returning to our first love. How can we fix it, right? And so first, one of three points, because we're Baptists, right? First, we have to realize that we never graduate from the gospel. What I mean by this is we never need to move past the fact that we are sinners in need of a savior, that before Jesus came, we were broken, lost, dead in our sin, sprinting towards hell, and Christ plucked us up and he saved us. And see, this is where I think the church at Ephesus started to go wrong, right from the get-go, right? I mean, think about it. They went from the rawness and the openness of just bringing out all their junk and burning it into the streets, right? And think about how far or how hard that would be to even get us to do that, right? To bring out all your stuff, all the stuff that you wanna hide, that you wanna bury, all your thoughts, all your, all your motives and everything that's up here and just putting it in the streets and saying, burn it, get rid of it, right? They went from that rawness and openness to just this cold mechanical religion, they went from deeply understanding their sinfulness and their need for Jesus to thinking that they had this whole Christianity thing figured out, right? And see, when we lose the understanding of our own sinfulness and our own need for Jesus, we just get on a one-way highway to becoming a Pharisee. We can't move on from that. We need to have a full just grip on the fact that we need grace just as much as anyone else. It doesn't matter how good we've become at playing the Christian life, we still need grace, we still need forgiveness, we still need the gospel every single day, right? We forget we're capable of just as much evil as anyone else and we start to judge, right? We start to point fingers and unless you think I don't wanna come off like I'm accusing because this was me. When I was in high school, I was Mr. Youth Group or whatever, you know? Like I, I thought very highly of myself and in turn I thought very lowly of the people in my school and so I started to judge. I was like, oh, I would never associate myself with that kid. Like how could he make such dumb choices? Oh, I would never do that. Oh, how can they be so stupid? And do you realize the arrogance in that? Like I had cleaned myself up, like I had brought myself to some place where I was better than everybody else. I didn't keep myself from evil. I didn't sanctify myself. The only sins I hadn't committed were by God's grace, right? If it weren't for Jesus, I would have wrecked my life long ago and I probably wouldn't be here today. But how quick do we forget that? How quick do we forget to sow the same grace that we ourselves have been shown? To find our first love of Jesus, we have to remember how much we need Jesus. We need to pray for humility. We have to make a habit of confessing our sins to God, confessing our sins to our community. Don't ever think we have it all figured out because the crazy thing about Christian maturity, and Jason has said this from stage before, is that as we mature in Christ, 
Though on the outside we look more and more like Jesus, on the inside we become more and more aware of our own sin. Right, we've talked about how the Holy Spirit is a a consuming fire and a few weeks ago how he goes room to room in our life, fixing us one part at a time because he's kind, right? And in this way, we should become more and more aware of our sin and we should be confessing more because God's showing us more and more things that he's gonna take and conform to the image of Jesus. And so as we mature, we should be repenting of sin more, not less. So my question to you today is, do you repent of sin more or less than when you were first saved? Do we repent of sin more or less? Are we more aware of things that God wants to turn to his purposes, to his kingdom? Are we less aware of that? Do we think we're just so much better off and we're this perfect fixed? Because if if we're repenting less, that should be a warning. Right, we need to run back to the truth of the gospel. I mentioned it earlier, that we are sinners in need of a savior and that savior is Jesus and we need his grace every single day. We can't move on from that basic truth. And so the second point is that we cannot let our public service replace our private devotion. And and what I mean by this is oftentimes this is what leads to the cold mechanical faith that we let the external evidences of our relationship with God replace anything internal, right? Everything is on the outside. Everything is just appearances. It's for show. And this is really common when our focus is on gaining praise from, from man, right? So think about this. If the only time, like, like in my marriage, if you only ever saw Christine and I together in public, right? Like we went out on dates, you saw us at church, you saw us maybe like walking down Main Street, but when public time was over, we went to two separate houses and never talked. Would you say that's a healthy marriage? No, absolutely not, right? There's no private devotion, there's no personal connection, there's no, it's all for show, it's all on the outside. And we can identify that that wouldn't be a healthy marriage, that that's backwards, but we do this all the time, right? We go to church, we go to Bible study, we go to growth groups, we go to choir, Young Life, FCA, BSF, and they're all good things. But when we get home, Jesus is absent from our hearts, our hands, our minds, our lives. He's nowhere to be found. And we have to be careful to not let our serving of God replace our knowing of God. Because that's not how it's set up to work. Right, and I'm not saying to go out and quit every single form of public fellowship. A, that would be unbiblical. B, I would be looking for a job, right? I'm in the business of that. But we can't let our serving replace our knowing. The foundation of our relationship with God has to be a personal walk where we know him intimately. And then out of that personal walk, then out of the overflow of that, then we go and serve. Then we go and love others, right? And you'll get burnt out on this. It's not sustainable. If you're trying to do all this stuff, but you're not being filled up by the living water, what strength are you doing it out of? We, can't, we just can't let that order get flipped. We can't let our public walk with Christ outpace our personal devotion to him. And then third point, final point, and this is the truth that hits at the core of it all. We have to stir our affections for Jesus. Remember earlier we talked about that scripture demands us have affections, have a love for Jesus. And this isn't something that just happens, right? I don't wanna leave you with this lofty expectation that you should just be like breaking down crying every single day of every single week. This is, this is a process, this takes work, right? This isn't just a wait, see, and hope thing. We have a responsibility to stir our affections up. And let's go back to the marriage image that I used last point, right? It's often said that there's different stages of love in human relationships. And the first is this infatuation, right? It's easy, it's, it's, it's butterflies and rainbows and everything is perfect, nothing's ever gonna go wrong. And it's usually like the early stage of a relationship. And then the second is when the relationship is matured, everything's not so perfect anymore and it's this conscious decision to choose to love someone. When you wake up every single morning, you might not feel like it and you choose to love them. But I would say there's a third, a little bit more cheery option and that's fighting for affection, right? This would be asking yourself, am I in love with my wife or my husband? Not do I love them, not am I loving them well, not am I doing the right things, are you in love with them? And those words matter, right? Are there real affections there? And if if the answer is no, that should be scary. That should be a warning. 
right? We have to run back to the things that we did early on, spontaneous dates, gifts, whatever crazy stuff you used to do for love, but run back to that, and I promise the affections will return. And it's the same way with our walk with Jesus. So do me a favor, ask yourself right now, are you in love with Jesus? Not are you doing the right stuff, not do you know a lot about him, are you in love with Jesus? When was the last time you felt your heart stirred up for him? When you felt him move, it was like the earth shook and you could see him more clearly than ever. Was it when you were saved when you were 10? 12, 13, 14, 20 years ago, 30 years ago? If so, that should startle you. And, and I don't mean to be legalistic. I don't mean to be harsh. But what if you ask me, hey, do you love your wife? And my answer was, yeah, we got married 20 years ago. That's not how it works. We have to fight for present affections to Jesus. We have to run to what we did at first. We have to find that which stirs us up for him and we have to lean into it, right? And I can tell you the two primary ones that it's gonna be for everybody. It's gonna be prayer and scripture. Those are the first things we run to that's across the board. Right, but there's other things that might speak differently to other people, right? Maybe it's great worship music, right? Maybe you come in here and you hear the choir sing and you hear Mark sing and you can just feel the presence of the Lord, right? Maybe it's listening to sermons or podcasts or nature. I don't know what it is, but you find those things and you lean into them. And another way that we can do this is we actually have the opportunity to do this this morning is we reflect on what Jesus has done for us. We reflect on his torture, his death on a cross for our sake so that we could have life, so that we could be free. And we get to do that this morning by partaking in the Lord's Supper. And so if you would go ahead and start getting the elements ready. A quick reminder, the Lord's Supper is for born-again believers. And so if you're a born-again believer this morning, we would love for you to partake in this with us. And if you don't have the elements, there'll be deacons in the aisles who can hand that out to you. And so this morning, we've talked a lot about this idea of losing our first love. You've heard me say it probably 25 times already. But we have a special opportunity this morning to sit here and reflect. In fact, like we said earlier, we're commanded to reflect and get right before God before we take the Lord's Supper so that we don't take it in an unworthy manner. And so in the quietness of your mind right now, just ask yourself, are you in love with Jesus? What are your motivations, your affections, right? Maybe, maybe you walked in here this morning and, and, and you've been doing all the right stuff, but you can tell that there's just been this coldness and this callous, callousness and just this, this going through the motions feeling. You can get that right this morning. Are we just going through all the motions, following all the rules to uphold some superficial appearance? Have we traded a love of Jesus for a love of the praise of man? And if we're honest, we've all walked in here struggling with this at some point. I know that I have. And, and I don't want it to come across as harsh because there is a hope and there is a truth. The good news this morning is that if you walked in here and you can't say that you're in love with Jesus. You have been going through the motions. You have felt it fade. You don't know how you got here, but you sit here and you realize, man, something is not right. You can get that right today. Amen. You can get that right with the Lord. There's forgiveness in Jesus. Even in the letter, he gives an opportunity to repent. He says, to the one who conquers can eat of the tree of life for eternity in paradise. We can get right with Jesus this morning. Scripture says that he is faithful and just. If we confess our sins, he'll forgive us. So I'm just gonna give a little bit of time here to get right with the Lord. Do business with him, whatever, whatever you need to do, whatever you need to pray. Just take a few moments to do that and then we'll take of the, take of the Lord's Supper. Just wanna encourage you to be honest and real with the Lord. He already knows the heart, so why hide? So as you hold the bread, 
dwell on the fact that this represents Christ's body broken for us. Remember that truth of the gospel that we never, ever, ever graduate from. That we were sinners in need of a savior, yet while we were enemies of God, he showed his love for us like this, that he died for us. Greater love hath no man. That our savior Jesus died so that we may live. Matthew 26, 26 says, now as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. So as you prepare the cup, just remember that this juice represents the blood of Christ. And as you do, dwell on the fact, dwell on this, right? This is the truth this morning, that because this blood was spilled, we have victory. That he willingly gave his life so that we may know him. Like, let's look past the callousness that comes with hearing that story a million times. Like, let's just let ourselves, for just a moment this morning, just be blown away by that. To really be awestruck. Let it sink in, let it draw you into a deep love of Jesus. I don't know about you guys, but nothing quite stirs my affection like knowing that the God of the universe died for me, for you. Let that stir you up this morning for him. And he took the cup and we had given thanks. He gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Lord, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to just have this, this kind of authentic check here this morning, to pause and look inward, to look at where do we stand with you, Lord. And, and I pray, God, that we would just be drawn into a new, fresh love for you today. That nobody would leave here with guilt or shame, but we would leave here being encouraged and refreshed, knowing that we can run to you, God that we can have a fresh, a new love with you, Jesus, and just how wonderful that is, Lord. And I pray that here as we give time to respond, people will be open to where you're moving in their lives, Lord. Thank you for your word in Jesus' name, amen.